a BJ with very basic Bible, going to go through Ruth, got to the end of chapter two, trying to think of uh, what's some more things we could talk about. Seems like I like to talk about context. What do I mean? Cultural context. What's cultural context? I live, what's everything around me, such as um, the house I live in, the stores I go to, the people I meet, what are they like? What kind of clothes do we wear? Uh, how do we talk to each other? What kind of food do we eat? Uh, uh, is there education? Is there entertainment? Um, how, how are the, just to think of random things. How are the roads? How is the weather? Weather is more like geographical context. We can't change that. But how are the roads? We can change the roads. We can build roads. Um, how, how is the water? Well, we can't really change the water because why? It comes up out of the ground. It just comes to us. That's just what it is. But we can change the water in that we can do plumbing and pipes. We can put filters. We can have water filter stations. Back in the day in the Bible, they didn't have pipes. They just got water from where they could find it. When they found a fresh spring of water, water that comes naturally out of the earth, it comes to the surface. You don't have to dig and dig. It doesn't, you know, get, it doesn't rain down. It doesn't come from a river, but it comes up out of the ground naturally. When you, when you find those places, nice, fresh water, it's like a gold mine. Today, I just go to my water faucet. It's right there. Got a natural filter. It's so easy, you know. So, I mean, I mean that's just an example. The context, the house I live in was built by somebody else. It was chopped out of wood from nearby or far away. I don't know. Uh, they put a bunch of wood together. They put nails that were made out of metal from mines somewhere. Where was the wood, the wood from, from for the nails? I don't know. They got it from Home Depot probably, ordered them from some big nail company. I See, I don't know. Back in the day, in the Bible, ancient days, ancient times, build their own houses. They had to build their own houses. They didn't use nails. They just put a bunch of rocks together. I don't think they used wood at all. Maybe for the roofs. May, uh, and then they put mud on top of it. Like what? Like we don't do that. We need shingles. I was showing some kids in Sunday school pictures of houses with grass. I saw on the TV, we, we played like worship songs on the TV. The kids sing and dance. Okay. I was like, hey, look. There's a picture of a house with grass on it. They were like, what in the world? These kids, they didn't know. They never seen that. It's not in their culture. In their culture, houses have shingles. Grass belongs on the ground. But in other cultures, roofs have grass on them. You know. So I'm trying to think of different things in the culture. How different is it when we read the Bible? Because if we read it without realizing that we're with, without realizing that we're thinking about our day and time. If we read the Bible and we, while reading it, we naturally read it, thinking about ourselves and our culture. When we do that, we mess it up because the Bible is a different culture. It was in a different time. The people back then who read the Bible made perfect sense to them. The people back then in Ruth's day, when she was, when people around Ruth's time were reading the book of Ruth, they didn't have to go, wait, uh, uh, Moab, where's that? Wait, they're, they're, what's gleaning? They're walking behind. Why are you staying in a field? Wait, why is she freaking out? Because she doesn't have kids. That doesn't matter. Uh, does she have a house? It doesn't say she have a house. What would it be like? They didn't have to think of all that. We do because we're not back in that time kind of fun i love the way god talks to us that way so let's share that screen and i'm trying to think of more things to get us into the cultural context back then you know all uh, right it's funny whenever i when i look at my screen and i look at you know like there i'm looking at the camera but over here is my face there's my face there's the camera there's the bible Face, camera. I mean, face, camera. Let's see. All right. Let's go back to the end of chapter two. Go. 
lots of cultural stuff because we talked about gleaning and such. You know. All right. Okay. Where is it at? Verse 18, I think, is a good place. Ruth returns to Naaman. Ruth picked up the grain she had gleaned and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. Ruth also took some out and gave Naomi what Ruth had left after Ruth was satisfied. After, after Ruth eats and is satisfied, she gives some, some to Naomi, probably to eat. Naomi probably hadn't had any food. Naomi got a job. She's an old lady. She's an old widow. Let's see. Bible Gateway. Naomi is a woman and a widow. Okay, go get you a job. It's not how it worked. In ASB, we're going to go to New American Standard right there. Widow. It wasn't necessarily a good thing always to be a widow. It wasn't like a, it wasn't automatically a curse, but becoming a widow could mean there's a curse or could mean there's something bad. There's a war, everybody gets killed. All the, all the men get killed. There's lots of widows. So they say, I'm going to make, I'm going to make you all widows. He's not saying it's bad to be a widow, but he's saying maybe like the circumstance that led to you being a widow. Why are all these people widows? Oh, because their husbands got killed in battle. Oh, that's no good. You know, so it's not that the widow is bad necessarily. Some and widow is usually for, for females only in the Bible. I'm like 90%, 99% sure if it says widow, it means women. Men, they could go get them a job. Could females go get them a job? For some reason, they saw that. Uh, it, just, it just didn't happen. It just doesn't seem to happen. All right. Ephesians, Ephesians Exodus, chapter 22. Various laws. Uh, you shall not oppress a stranger nor torment him. So God's talking to the Israelites. God's saying, here's the law that y'all are going to follow. Like today we have laws. If we break the speed limit, that's bad. If we steal something from the store, that's against the law. You know, murder is against the law, you know. <laughs> so what's their law like back then? What kind of, okay, here's some of the law they had. You shall not oppress a stranger nor torment him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall not oppress any widow or orphan. So why would they say, don't oppress a stranger, don't oppress a widow or an orphan? Why would they relate the two? If widows could just go do whatever they wanted, why would they be in danger of being oppressed? I guess anybody could be oppressed. I guess a married person could be oppressed. But here they talked about a stranger and an orphan person with no parents, a kid with no parents, could definitely be oppressed. A stranger could definitely be oppressed because they come in, they don't have a field, they don't have a house, they're not married to an Israelite, right? All the stuff you get when you're an Israelite, you know, whenever you have a family there, you have land which you can grow your crops on, which you can build your house on and live in. You got a large family. Large family means more workers for your crops to get you food, more protection from, say, burglars and, and bad people. You got you got five five men with their wives and their kids all living in the same field or the same house or the same area, more protection. You can make more money that way. Yes. That's the way it was back then. See how much different it is then than today? <laughs> um, so a stranger doesn't have any of that. They're a stranger. They come in. They got nobody. Don't torment or oppress them. And don't oppress any widow or orphan. If you oppress him at all, and if he does cry out to me, I will assuredly hear his cry. It says his. But a widow would, most, would be a her. But the orphan and the stranger be a him. Everything is his. That's just the way it goes. <laughs> My anger will be kindled, and I will kill you with the sword. Your and your wives, if you oppress the, if you, your wives shall become widows. Your children fatherless. Look, don't oppress a widow or orphan. If you do, 
I'll make your wives widow and your children orphans. Kind of scary. God saying, hey, if I'm going to punish you. I'm not punishing the widow or the orphan necessarily. But when I punish you, if it happens with, say, war and famine, well, the sword, so the war, if, if that happens, your wives who don't fight in a battle and your kids who don't fight in a battle will become widows and orphans. That'll be a punishment. It's no good for them. No good for the widow and the orphan. And that's why you shall not oppress any widow or orphan. Okay, don't do it. Ruth and Naomi. Naomi is a widow. Full chapter, Leviticus 21, 14. Uh, where is it at? The priest who is highest among his brothers, on whose head the anointing oil has been poured, and who has been consecrated to wear the garden, that priest shall not uncover his head or tear his clothes. He shall not approach it for dead people. Don't mourn for dead people. Uncover your head is a sign of mourning. Tearing your clothes is a way of mourning. Don't do that. Don't be sad and weep. If you're the highest high priest, don't do that. That's just the way it was. Don't approach any dead person. Don't defile himself, even for his father and mother. Don't come up, you know, if you're today, if you're a pastor, it's fine. We can do that. But back then they had these laws. The priest was supposed to be separated. Nor shall he leave the sanctuary, nor profane the sanctuary of his God, for the consecrated oil is upon him. I am the Lord. Okay. So that's a priest. Super holy, super set apart dude. Like I said, today we don't have that law. Today, that's not the way God works with us. But back then, that's how they did things. God worked with them the way they did. Verse 13. That priest shall take a wife in her virginity. Okay? When she's a virgin, hasn't had sex. You're not going to take a widow or a divorced woman or one is who who is profaned by prostitution. Remember, this is a priest, highest of highs, super holy, super consecrated. You know, don't be going to touch no dead people. You got anointing oil on you. You're super holy. These he shall not take. Can't take a widow. Can't take a divorced woman. Can't take one who's profaned by prostitution. So it's to be set apart. So widows, you know, the, can't marry the priest, okay? Are there so many priests that, oops, all the widows, all the priests are married. I guess you widows are out of luck. No, no, no. But it's just pointing out how, again, how a widow or a divorced woman or someone who's a prostitute, they're, they're, they've got less options, you know. He is to marry a virgin of his own people. Okay. Widows got less options there. <laughs> If a priest's daughter becomes a widow or divorced, the priest's daughter, so 2114 for a priest. We talked about don't be married, no widow if you're a priest. 20, Leviticus 22. Okay. If a priest's daughter becomes a widow and has no child and returns to her father's house in her, so in her youth, so she's a priest, her father is a priest, she returns to her father's house in her youth, she may eat at her father's food. No layman's going to eat the food. No random person. But if your daughter becomes a widow in her youth, she can return to her parents' house. Even if he's a priest, she can eat the pre and she can eat his food. Good. They're trying to take care of their daughter. Cool. You know, widows don't have many options, so let's take care of them. She will remain valid against her as future judge. God executes justice for the orphan and the widow shows his love for the stranger it doesn't say he executes justice for the hard-working man he shows his love for the uh, for boaz who who who's a bethlehemite and has, has a field yes god does love them and show justice for them but he's trying to point out god is that look guys even the widow is an orphan i'm gonna execute justice for i'm gonna even show my love for a stranger god's a Evidently, God's a loving God, and evidently, these people need justice. They need love. Why would God pay extra special attention to them if they didn't? 
Levite because he has a portion of the stranger. The Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance among you. Remember, the Levites have their own towns. They get fed by the offerings that you give. Okay. So the Levites don't have a job. They don't go, they, they do have fields for the cattle, I think. Hmm. I read, I remember reading that in Deuteronomy last time we had Ruth. They have filled with, with, for cattle, I believe. Yeah, yeah. But they don't have a portion or inheritance. They get a town given to them. They get fields given to them. They don't, it's not a perpetual thing. Hmm. Kind of strange because I think, you know, Levi does have stuff. The stranger. So I'm not, I'm not so sure about that with the Levi, but here we go. The stranger, the orphan, and the widow. The three are together again. Stranger, orphan, and widow we're in your town they shall eat and be satisfied in order that the lord your god may bless you and all the work your hand has done let's read this full chapter 1429 you shall certainly tithe all the produce from what you sow which comes from the field every year so they need the field they go reap the harvest they tithe it 10 percent. they give it to the priest you shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God at the place where the Lord established his name, the tithe of your grain, your new wine, your oil, your first, and your herd and your flocks, so you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. So when you give a tithe as a, as a sacrifice and you get to eat some of it, you're going to only do it where God says. Don't go out to random places and such. And that's what the temple, you know, the temple, they had a tabernacle in the wilderness. Eventually they built a temple. They only sacrifice at the temple. You only give tithes to the temple. When there's a feast, you go to the temple. When you're eating of your tithes, when the priests are eating of your tithes, when you're, you're eating a sacred assembly at the, at the place God designates, and that's it. Okay, where's the... Um... One second. Control F. Whoa, way down there. Holy moly. All right. If the distance is so great, you were not able to bring the tithe, since the place where the Lord your God chooses said his name is too far away, you shall exchange it for money, put the money in your hand, go to where your Lord chooses, and you may spend the money on whatever your heart desires, ox and cheap wine, strong drink, whatever your heart desires. Then you shall eat in the presence of the Lord. So whenever you're like, hey, I've got to go really far to get to this place. You sell all your stuff. You take the money. When you get, you sell your tithe. You take the money. When you get to the place, you spend it on wine, other strong drinks, sheep, oxen. Eat to your heart's content. It's a festival. They had lots of festivals back then. They made lots of pilgrimages back then. That's true. And hey, don't neglect the Levite down here. At the end of every third year, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in that year. You shall deposit it in your town. Okay, so now they're not going somewhere. Now they're staying in their town. So I got a little off. I was trying to read some of the context. So some of the context, they leave and go far away to the place. Now they might live near that place, but the place where God chooses, which we think of that as Jerusalem, right? Well, we're right now, there's no Jerusalem. David, who is many, 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 many years after Moses, David conquered Jerusalem. Yeah, David and Goliath, that David, he conquered Jerusalem. So right now, Deuteronomy, they haven't even gone into the promised land. Jerusalem is in the promised land. So right now, Moses is saying, wherever God chooses, some random, you know, wherever God chooses, that's where you're going to go. At the end of every third year, you shall bring out the produce of the, in that year and deposit it in your own town. Okay. Maybe there's a place where God will say, here in this town. But, you know, your town. The Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance among you, and the stranger, the orphan, and the widow who are in your town shall come eat and be satisfied. Okay, I'm guessing what they're saying is every three years, you're going to deposit the tithe. Instead of taking it to the faraway place, you're going to put it, you're going to take your tithe and leave it in the town. That will build a store up for like welfare we could we could call it and who would he get to eat of it well the levite because he's a priest he doesn't work for a job he doesn't go out and farm in the field the orphan 
kids can't work for stuff. I mean, they could, they'd get taken advantage of. They're just kids. The stranger, he doesn't know anybody. He get taken advantage of. He doesn't have a field. He came from another place. The widow, the widow's husband has died. The widow got no field, got nothing. So who is in your town? The widow, the orphan, and the stranger. All this to say, She also took some out and gave to Naomi what was left and she was satisfied. Naomi's a widow. They ain't got no food. But Ruth is a widow. She ain't got no food. But they got to go. They got to take the grain. They got to bring it back. They got to eat it. Her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? May he who took notice of you be blessed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, she told her mother-in-law whom the man had, she, she had worked. She said, the, man, the name of the man whom I worked with today is Boaz. Okay. She calls it work. You know, she's gleaning in the field. I guess it's work. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness from the living and from the dead. I think the, may he be blessed of the Lord. The Lord has not withdrawn his kindness from the living Naomi and Ruth, and from the dead, Naomi and Ruth have husbands that are dead, or Naomi could be saying, I have no husband, I have no children, I have no way to pass on my family name, I am as good as dead, but the Lord is blessing me anyway, that could be what Naomi's saying, again, Naomi said to her, the man of ours, the man is a relative, the man is our relative. He is one of our redeemers. We talked about that last time, the redeemer. She could be saying, I'm as good as dead because I have no redeemer. I have no, I have no husband. I have no son. But Boaz, wait. The man is our relative. He is one of our redeemers. I'm looking, when I do this, I'm looking at my cats. I'm afraid they're going to start fighting here. What are y'all doing? Y'all start there. I got two cats. The older one's grumpy. He don't like the younger one. Mm -hmm. the younger one's kind of a pain anyway so yeah. but they didn't have cats in the bible to my knowledge the, i don't think they work let's see yeah let's see what happens cattle <laughs> but yeah oh wait so cattle cattle okay let's do this hit the lollipop It still doesn't. Oh, why didn't it? It should just give me for CAT. Oh, it's giving me for cattle still. I'm going to hit, let's see, minus cattle. Let's see. Catches. Catastrophe. Minus catastrophe. Minus catches. You think cat is in the Bible? Let's see. Cat. Minus catch. Caterpillar. The only two. Caterpillar, caterpillar. So if I hit this, okay. Minus caterpillar. Not caterpillar. There we go. But there are... Uh, Lions or are leopards. Those are cats, I guess, but no house cats. They didn't have a house cat. They didn't have pets. Did they have pets? I don't think so. I don't recall. It does talk about sometimes raising a, uh, she raised it like it was one of his own. You know, so. Again, Naomi said, this man is our relative. He is one of our redeemers. I'm guessing she means the living and the dead. In other words, God's nice to the dead because of he is one of our redeemers. I no longer have to be dead. Is she having to spell that all out? Is she having to explain it? Does she think in her mind, wait, I don't have any. So, so she heard that, wait, there's Boaz. Well, he's a redeemer. Wait, wait. Hey, Ruth. Hey, Ruth. Come here. You, you have no husband. I have no husband. I mean, I'm as good as dead, but, but Boaz is a relative. Wait, Boaz can redeem us. Our husbands redeemed us. So much like our husbands redeemed us and our kids would, but now they wouldn't. Now, Boa, she's not having to think of all that. No, no. Like I said, 
to us, we have to spell it out because in our culture, we don't do that. We don't have redeemers. You know, if, if, uh, if, if I were to pass away, my wife wouldn't go and look for my brother and say, Hey, you need to redeem me. Come have babies with me. She wouldn't do that. My brother would be like, you crazy lady. <laughs> my brother's married, has kids of her own. Well, so what? You should come redeem. Uh, uh, come give me your field. My brother would be like, I don't have a field. What are you talking about? My field is the uh, military and computers. You know, wait, that, not that kind of field. We don't do that today. But back then, this was normal everyday stuff. So whenever Naomi, I mean, whenever Ruth is like, hey, whenever no, Naomi is like, hey, uh, he's nice to living in the dead. Boaz is one of our redeemers. Ruth is like, hey, he can redeem. Hmm. Since I'm not sure if Moab, where Ruth came from, had the whole redeemer thing, maybe that could be why, because Ruth is from Moab, Naomi's from Israel. Moab might not have the concept of a redeemer. Israel has a concept of a redeemer. God wants people to be taken care of. God wants people to be redeemed. You know. One second, guys. One cat. I might have to go lock. I might have to go lock one of my cats. In. It's a catastrophe. <laughs> yeah. All right. They wouldn't have to, you know, this will be normal to them. Ruth, Naomi, though, might be spelling it out to Ruth. This man is a relative. He's one of our redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabite said, furthermore, so, so it's kind of a conversation. Hey, uh, oh, whoa, where did you go glean today? Oh, the man, his name was Boaz. Ruth, Naomi, no way. Hey, he's one of our redeemers. Ruth, hey, furthermore, he said, you are to stay close to my servants until the end of the harvest. <gasps> it is good, my daughter, that you do not go out with the young women. So they're like having this conversation back and forth. Naomi seems very happy that you do not have this go out with it that you go out with his young women so that others do not assault you in another field. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to look something up real quick. Open. Field. Okay. Let the live bird go free in the open field. He shall not let live bird in the open field. Leviticus 14, Leviticus 14, 17. Oh, hey, hey. We just talked about sacrificing in one place. Look at this. This shall be done. So the sons of Israel were bringing their sacrifices, which they were sacrificing in the open field. So they will bring them to the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting to the priest. Sacrifice them as sacrifices of peace offerings to the Lord. They were sacrificing them out in the open field, but now they're going to bring them to the doorway, the tent of meeting to the Lord. Okay. Open fields, if anyone though touches, has been killed. Mm. That's no good. Mm. Right. Purity judges. I'm looking for a specific Bible verse. Where Ruth gleans and Boaz is filled. Look at that. Okay, Genesis. Go to uh, there's Leviticus, Genesis. You see it? it? Says Genesis. Oh, um, Exodus. I believe we want Leviticus. I'm gonna go ahead and go to Leviticus. All right, live bird in an open field. We just read about that, right? Sacrificing open. We just read the various laws. The edges do not reap until the very edges of your field. You know that's what Boaz is like. Hey. Hey guys, y'all know the law, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, leave the edges of the field for the the poor and for Ruth. Hey, there's a girl named Ruth. Yeah, yeah. Leave the edge of the field so she can glean those. Okay. Um, I'm looking really fast with my eyes. I'm trying to go quickly. That's from the field, open field, pastor field, through the field, the rich you deprive the field of his own property. Contract the fill years after the fill they shot a fifth, and this jubilee, which has sold his own property, fill shall return. Drax. Okay, I'm going to say, cry out. 
Uh, Genesis, a bitter cry, Exodus, and cry out, Exodus, and cry out to me. Hear his cry, that's close. <gasps> okay, Deuteronomy 24, 24, full chapter, 22, 24, various laws. If a man is found sleeping with a married woman, then both of them shall die. The man who slept with the woman and the woman, so you shall eliminate the evil from Israel. Okay. If there is a girl who is a virgin, now, now, is that fair? What if the man like captured the woman? What if the woman captured the man? They, they don't come and go, hey, no, this is unfair. You know, do they get a trial? They probably do. I, actually, in other places, it talks about having a trial. Uh, it's a, it, it talks about like court proceedings. Like we watch today, you know, Law and Order on TV or whatever. We watch courtroom dramas. There are television shows where the lawyers are arguing back and forth. You know, we, we see, we see uh, real laws all day. People get called for jury duty. Okay. They had stuff like that back then. So I'm guessing both of them shall die. What that means is if they are found guilty of consensually sleeping with one another, committing adultery, the man and the woman are both agreeing, hey, let's commit it. I know, I know you're married, but let's commit adultery anyway, or whatever. The, the penalty is death. That's my guess. After they've established it, you have to establish it on the testimony of two or three witnesses. You've probably heard that phraseology, that phrasing, two or three witnesses. Yeah, that's from the Bible. So if there is a girl who is a virgin betrothed to a man and another man finds her in the city and sleeps with her, then you shall bring them both out to the gate of that city and you shall stone them to death. So if a man finds a girl and sleeps with her, they both, the girl, because she did not cry out for help, though she was in the city she didn't cry out for help she didn't go hey help me hey I'm... in other words it's saying what it's trying to say is she agreed to it a man finds her they lay together the girl doesn't say no stop stop in other words they're agreeing with it they're not saying if the man gagged her to where she couldn't cry out you know let's the man cap captured her broke her jaw and then rapes her okay so the girl gets punched because she couldn't cry out because her jaw no no that's Come on, that's not what it's saying. It's trying to say that's a whole consensual thing I've mentioned, I mentioned a minute ago. She did not cry out, though she was in the city. And the man, because he has violated his neighbor's wife, like I said, court proceedings, you need two or three witnesses. So they're not just automatically going to go, well, we didn't hear her cry out. What if she tried and he stopped there? What if they had two or three witnesses? You know, they're, they're trying the best they can. But they didn't have cameras in ancient Israel. So, but. If the man finds a girl who is betrothed in the field and the man seizes her and rapes her, then only the man who raped her shall die. Okay. And you are not to do anything to the girl. There is no sin in the girl worthy of death. For just as a man rises against his neighbor and murders him, so is this the case. So a man goes and murders a dude. They're assuming if it's in the open field, they're going to treat the case like it's like it's hidden. She couldn't do anything about it. It's in the open field. Look at this. When he found her in the field, the betrothed girl, she probably cried out, but there was no one to save her. Okay? No one to save her. She cried out. Probably, no, so, in other words, what if the girl didn't cry out? What if they're in the open field and the girl said, heck, yeah, so nobody's around. Nobody's around. They're off. They're off in the woods and nobody's around, you know people congregate in cities they generally avoided the open field they avoided the wilderness it was dangerous out there you know um today we go hiking in wilderness for fun back then if they go hiking and they fall down and hurt themselves they get captured by bandits they don't have smartphones there's no 911 they're going to generally avoid that so if you're in a private place away from everybody in the wilderness the benefit of the doubt goes to the girl what if she agreed to it oops too bad dude Men have a better responsibility back then, bigger responsibility. So, hey, look at this. Naomi said, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with this young woman so, you, so that others do not assault you in another field. You're in an open field. There might be other people there, but there are probably a lot of men. 
the women in the other field might be scared. At least she's saying, hey, Boaz is a good person. Boaz has ordered his men to protect you. The women know you there. Boaz has already taken you under his wing, right? We talked about that last time, the shelter of his wing. So Ruth and Naomi didn't hear the conversation between Ruth and Boaz. Naomi didn't hear the conversation about, hey, come stay. Naomi did not, was not with Ruth whenever Boaz said, come stay in my field, you know. Naomi wasn't there. But Ruth right here is telling Naomi, hey, this is what happened. Their conversation might have been longer than what's recorded here, you know. We have the recorded conversation, but there could have been more. Ruth could have explained a lot more. So, but, you know, Naomi, like I said, this was normal to them. Whenever Ruth said, furthermore, Boaz said to me, you were to stay close to my servants till they finished all my harvest. Naomi's like, oh, stay close. Hey, that's true. You should stay close because, hey, Boaz, he's probably a good person. That's why I told you to stay close. Boaz gave you all this grain that he's probably a good person. So yeah, yes, do stay in it. You didn't get assaulted today. So, you know, stay there. She's using her brain, you know. I just saw another thing over here real quick. Okay, we're talking about marriage. They want marriage. Everybody wants, if you're a woman, you better get married to be taken care of. Okay, Ruth and Naomi, you know, Ruth, she, Naomi, she passed, her husband passed away. She got nobody. She was super bitter at the end of chapter one. Ruth's husband passed away got nobody. Naomi told Ruth, hey, go back to your family so you can get married, so you can be taken care of. Ruth said, no, I'm going to stay with you, you know, to help you out. So they're helping each other out. Marriage, though, is generally the way to be taken care of. That's just the way it was back then. God worked with them where they were. Look at this. If a man finds a girl who is a virgin, who is not betrothed, Okay, so up here, who is betrothed, you find a virgin who is, uh, in other words, engaged, we'd call it engaged, but uh, since they did, I almost said forced marriages, um, arranged marriages, you know, the father would give his daughter to somebody else, or since they had arranged marriages, they called it betrothed, so the girl's still kind of too young, but she is betrothed to the other person, so you might be, so the girl might be betrothed for many years, you never know, but uh, because she's too young still, uh, the man doesn't have a, a, a dowry payment. A dowry payment, you pay money uh, to prove that, like, hey, I have plenty of money. I'm going to give it to the father to show you I have the money. The father uses the money for the girl, make sure she's healthy, make sure she's taken care of. So then the girl can go with the guy who had plenty of money who can then take care of the girl and such. Oh, that's pretty cool that way. Today, fiercely independent women. I can go get my own job. I can go to school. I can make my own money. Back then, just the way it was. See the differences. A man finds a girl who is a virgin, but who's not betrothed. She's not betrothed to anybody yet. She hasn't been put in an arranged marriage yet. If the man seizes her, has sexual relations with her, and they're discovered, the man who had sexual relations with her shall give the girl's father 50 shekels of silver. There's a dowry. And she shall become his wife. Okay. She shall become, she's got to be taken care of by him. You know, the man might not even like her, but hey, you laid with her. You def had sex with her. Now you're going to be a husband and you're going to take care of her. Today we go, wait a minute. You're going to force her to marry her rapist. Some people say it that way. Back then, that's not the way they saw it. That's psychologically scarring to us, yes. To them, no. To them, I mean, that's just, to them, this was a good thing. You know, it's not God saying, oh, we're going to do a different one way and different another way because it, the morals change. It's not the morality that's changing because what does God want? It seems like God wants a girl to be taken care of. A dude violates her, the dude then has to take care of her. Just like today, two people get divorced. One person has to pay child support to take care of the other kid. We're making them take care of people. And you can't force me to take care of people. Look at that. You know, I'm, God's doing it right here. Right? So, you know, this is the law, remember. So, 
the law, like the like 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 I said uh, today, the law is if uh, two people get divorced, one pays child support to the other. It's in the law. You know they have to go to court and stuff. That's what we're talking about here in uh, Deuteronomy, the law. He's not allowed to divorce her all his days. He has to keep her. He has to take care of her. It's pretty cool, huh? Man, the man has a lot of responsibility. So, okay. Y'all hear my cats? One of my cats, he's freaking out, running around, meowing like crazy. Man, that cat's going. He don't like all this stuff about, you know, hey, dude, hey, cat, Saul, don't worry. I'm not going to divorce you all my days. <laughs> don't worry. I will take care of you. You will have plenty of litter and food all my days. I paid a hefty sum for these cats. Goodness. <sighs> okay. They are very cuddly and warm at night. <laughs> anyway. So, okay. So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz in order to glean until the end of the barley harvest and the end of the wheat harvest. Okay, good. Harvests end, obviously. When winter comes, you know, no more harvest. Everything dies. She lived with her mother-in-law. Okay, they lived together. In other words, I think what that's still trying to say, because this whole thing has been about a lady lost her husband and lost her kids, got no husband. Now, there's a, the lady says, hey, daughter-in-law, go back to your own home where you can find you a husband and a family to marry into. Uh, Ruth says, no, I'm going to stay with you and I'm going to be with you and your family. We're going to be a family. So they're, fa they're a non-traditional family. The two ladies living together, right? Uh, uh, the mother and the daughter, the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law living together. In Israel, that'd be a non-traditional family, you know. And even though Boaz is there, Boaz is a redeemer. Naomi could be redeemed by Boaz. Ruth lived with her mother-in-law until the end of the barley harvest, until the end of the harvest. You know, they lived again. You know, they, they didn't go out right away. They, and like, hey, Boaz, you're my redeemer. You would think they would. I don't know. Then, at the end of the harvest, then Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, my daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may go well for you? Go back and look at chapter one. Naomi said to Ruth, the bar, you know, they lived together till the end of the barley and the wheat harvest. Then Naomi's like, hey, I need, I'm your mother-in-law. I need to, to get security for you. Here's what Naomi said. Okay. Uh, where is it at? They took for themselves more by why this woman is why? Okay, okay. A limit like Naomi's husband died. Left with her two sons. Okay. So Naomi's left with her two sons. They took for themselves more by women. One was named Orpa, the other is named Ruth. Both the sons, Malin and Chilean, they died. Left with her two sons. She was left without her two sons and her husband. So it's just Ruth. Orpa and Naomi. Orpa and, Na and Ruth, they don't have to stay. They could leave. Naomi arose with her daughter-in-law to return from the land of Moab because the Lord had visited his people by giving them food, so they're going to go back to Judah. So she departed. Her two daughters went with her. They went on the way, but Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, go. So, remember chapter three. Uh, Ruth, you're my daughter-in-law. The wheat harvest is over. I need to secure for you and make sure your future is well. I should do that. That's what Ruth says. That's what Naomi says to Ruth. What did Naomi say before to Ruth? Go return each of you to your mother's house. May the, your mother's house. Your mom can take care of you. Remember, we read that thing about the high priest. If the daughter of the high priest gets, if the daughter gets uh, widowed whenever she's really young, it did say young. I wonder about when she grows up. I wonder why not when she grows up. But when she, uh, young back then was, and we say it's different. I'm not sure. Okay. If she gets, uh, if, if, if the daughter 
gets widowed when she's young, she can go and stay with her with her with her dad, even if her dad's a high priest. Okay, so you can go back to your house. So right here, kind of a similar thing. Go return each of you to your mother's house. Now, of course, they live in Moab, so there's different laws, different rules. But I'm saying it's kind of the same thing. They're going to, they need security. They're young ladies who are no longer married. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with me and, and with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you might find a place of rest, each one of in the house of her husband. So another, oh, you're going to go back to your mother's house where you can be taken care of. And hey, go back and find yourself a good husband and you can find rest when you find yourself a good husband. But now, so she's looking after them, them. Naomi is looking after them. Look, I don't have anything for you. I got no kids to give you, okay? Go back to your own place and live where you got a family, where you can get a husband. And what does Naomi do here? My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may go well for you? Now then, is Boaz not our relative, with whose young women you were? Behold, he is winnowing. Okay, so remember, she was with Boaz's young women. It'd be kind of like this. Uh, let's read it in a... Uh, let's read it. Now, Boaz, with whose young women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Okay. Isn't Boaz our relative? Haven't you been working with his female servants? Okay. So you understand what he's saying. This this over here in the NESB that I like reading from, kind of strange sentence structure, but now you get what I'm saying. Okay. 48 minutes. Okay. We're getting along. We're getting there. We'll beat the Ruth in no time. Uh now then, is Boaz not our relative? Boaz, with whose young women you were. Behold, he is winnowing barley at the threshing floor tonight. We talked about that, winnowing barley. Okay. Let's see. Winnowing. Oh, hey, Ruth, three, two. Jeremiah 15, seven. Those destined for death to death. Those destined for sore to sore. Those destined for famine to famine. Oh my goodness. Oh, where should we go? Then you were to tell them, this is what the Lord says. You're going to die. You're going to be in sword. You have captivity. Man, I will appoint over them four kind of doom. Man. So these are evidently bad people. These evidently aren't good people that God, you know, up here, judgment must come. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. Uh, the sword to kill, the dogs to drag away, the birds to sky, and the animals to devour and destroy. Man, I will make them an object of terror because of Manasseh. Manasseh did evil, wicked things big time. And the people followed him. The people did evil, wicked things with him. So here... These are not good people. God's saying, I'm going to uh, get ready. Of course, if they turn back to the Lord, there's so many places where God says, if you turn back to me, I will relent from disaster. Okay, so but Jeremiah's warning them what's going to happen. Indeed, who will have pity on you, Jerusalem? Who will, or who will mourn for you? Uh, no one, basically. Or who will turn aside to ask about your welfare? In other words, no one will. You have forsaken me. You keep going backward. So... I will stretch out my hand against you and destroy you. I am tired of relenting. So God has been like, he's been relenting a lot for these people. I will, so he's talking about how he's judged them. They're going to go to death. Uh, the dog is going to drag them away. No one's going to uh, mourn for them. I'm not going to relent anymore. I will winnow them with a winnowing fork at the gates of the land. I will winnow them with a winnowing fork. Must be a bad thing. Uh, evidently, though, it has to do with barley and wheat. Um, he is winnowing barley at the threshing floor tonight. God is these bad people he's judging. He's going to winnow them. So winnowing barley must be like a, it must be a not cool thing. If, if dragging dogs away and birds of the sky and animals to devour them and sword to kill them, if that is this, you know, 
winnowing them with a winnowing fork is on the same level, then winnowing barley must be like a something that would hurt if you did to humans. <laughs> must not be good. All right, all right, all right. Winnowing. Oh, hey, Matthew 13, 12, full chapter, John the Baptist. Uh, when he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you are offspring of vipers who warn you to flee from the wrath to come. Whoa. Jeremiah was just talking to people and saying, y'all are bad, y'all are being judged. John the Baptist saying the same to the religious leaders of his day. John the Baptist, basically a prophet. Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. Oh, hey, that's what I said. Look, look, produce fruits consistent with repentance. Okay, do it anyway. Uh, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, if you don't bear good fruit, you're going to be cut down and thrown in the fire. Okay, so you can repent. If you don't bear good fruit, then God's going to take his axe, chop down the tree, Throw the bad fruit in the bad tree into the fire. It'll burn up. You're going to be burned up. You're going to be like a tree that's cut down. But if you don't produce good fruit. As for me, I baptize you, I baptize you with water for repentance. But Jesus or the Messiah, you know, the one who's coming after me is mightier than I. I'm not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. Boaz is winnowing barley at the threshing floor. Jesus is going to winnow people with his winnowing fork, and he's going to clear them from the threshing floor. Okay. Just like Jesus or God, just like bad people, the axe is already the root of the tree. They're going to get cut down and thrown into a fire. Jesus here has a winnowing fork in his hand. He's going to clear his threshing floor, just like you would clear barley from your threshing floor, I guess, with the winnowing fork. He will gather his wheat into the barn. He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Jesus will gather his people into the barn. He's going to clear his threshing floor. How is he going to clear it? By gathering his people, his wheat, into the barn. But the chaff, the people, the yarn is people, the bad fruit, Okay, uh, therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit, okay, if you don't repent, you're going to be burned up with unquenchable fire. Okay, Jesus is going to separate the wheat and put it into his barn and the chaff burn it up with fire. Chaff is no good, I guess. You're going to throw the chaff away, you're going to keep the wheat. So here, evidently, this is not a metaphor over here with Boaz. Jesus and John the Baptist using it as a metaphor. He's comparing good people to good fruit, bad people to bad fruit. He's saying he's going to take his good people. He's comparing them to wheat. He's going to take the wheat, put it in his barn, going to take the chaff, going to burn it up. You know, right here. This isn't a metaphor for people. This is a real thing. Evidently, Winnowing barley, he's going to separate the chaff. Well, it does say barley. It doesn't say wheat. Over here, it's wheat. Over here, it's barley. It's probably the same thing. I mean, winnowing is the same thing, I guess. You know, um, I guess you could winnow things differently. But in other words, he's doing the job of winnowing his, his food. You know, we got, got a little off, but I was just trying to figure, see if we could figure out what is winnowing in the Bible kind of figured it out he's gonna uh separate barley from i guess chaff at the threshing floor okay now then his body relative with his young behold he is winnowing barley at the threshing floor so we okay so she knows where he's at she knows what he's doing I'd, if i was ruth i'd be like um okay why are you telling this naomi naomi says wash yourself therefore anoint yourself Put on your best clothes. Okay, you know, wash up, get looking pretty. Anoint yourself over here. And do as I tell you. Take a bath, put on perfume, and dress in your nicest clothes. Okay, going to get all, doll, all dolled up, we say. Going to get all prettified. 
prettified. Put wash, put on perfumed oil, and wear your best clothes. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't take showers very often back then. And go down to the threshing floor. That's where Boaz is right now, at least. But do not reveal yourself to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. I'm guessing they mean Boaz. So come up, Boaz. Don't so go down there, but keep yourself hidden. Wait, if he's down there threshing when wheat, he's like doing work, right? He's doing a job. What if a lady shows up in her best clothes? And wait, wait, until he's finished eating and drinking, why is he at where he's working? Why is he going to be eating and drinking? I guess it did say back here. Do, 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 do. Do all that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband. May the Lord reward you. I have found favor in your sight. I am not like one of your female servants. And at mail time, Boaz said to her, come here that you may eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers. So she's working. Okay. Then they have a conversation. Boaz says, I know who you were. Ruth says, uh, I'm a foreigner, but you still care about me. Okay. Then they're still working because then at meal time, Boaz said, hey, come in and eat. When she got up to glean from eating. So assuming this is in chronological order. She's out gleaning. Boaz talks to her. She's gleaning some more. Boaz says, let's eat some food. She goes and gleans some more. Boaz says, hey, let her glean even among the sheep." purposely let some slip out so she gleaned in the field until evening then when she beat out what she had gleaned it was about if that's the winnowing process i believe let's see let's see when she beat out when she beat out when she threshed okay thresh is threshed and winnowed i think so the threshing floor i think threshing and winnowing are the same i'm i'm, I'm pretty sure maybe maybe uh, there are two different things in the same process. You're trying to get the, you're trying to get the wheat and the barley prepared. And one step is winnowing. One step is threshing. I'm not sure they all go together, but they, she was out doing work in the field. Then she came and she rested in the hut. Then she goes out and works in the field. Then Boaz said, Hey, come eat with me. Then she goes out and works some more. So he has finished eating and drinking. So maybe that's what they did at threshing floors. Maybe they, they did work, they threshed. Maybe it wasn't that hard to work. Maybe women showed up all the time at these places dressed up nicely and they eating and drinking, drinking. It gets a little drunk, maybe. It's a little food, gets a little happy. I, I'm, not, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. Um, I could look up stuff about feast, about eating and drinking, but generally it doesn't, it doesn't compare, the, it doesn't talk about winnowing while eating and drinking right, so no verses have winnow and drink if only i could look up like an entire chapter and see if you know winnow eat Also, the oxen and donkeys that work the ground will eat seasoned feed, which has been winnowed with shovel and pitchfork. So even the donkeys are going to eat good food. It's going to have been winnowed with shovel and pitchfork. It's going to be seasoned. I'm going to look at this just for fun. Just see if it sheds any kind of light. 30, 24, Holy One says, that was it 24, gracious and just? Okay. Mm, let me look. Uh, you people in Zion, it happens to Jerusalem. Isaiah was well after the time of David, so Jerusalem was the capital. This is the book of Isaiah. So it's really time. Yeah. He will certainly be gracious to you. Ah, when he hears you, he will answer you. Okay. When he hears your cry, God's going to answer you. Although the Lord has given you the bread of deprivation and water of oppression, the Lord, your teacher, will no longer hide himself. But your eyes will see your teacher. Your teacher. They call God a teacher. Okay. Your ears will hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right or the left, whenever you're fixing to do something bad, God, your teacher, will help you. 
and you will desecrate the carved images plated with silver. You will cast the metal images plated with gold into the fire. You will cast them into the fire. You will scatter them as filthy rag and say, be gone. You'll get rid of your idols. In other words, good stuff will start happening. God's going to be helping you. You're going to, man, this is, God is gracious and just. Then he will give you rain for your seed, which you will sow in the ground. Yeah. Bread from the yield of the ground. It will be rich and plentiful. Yeah. You're going to get rain. You're going to get lots of bread, rich and plentiful. On that day, your livestock will gaze in a wide path, graze in a wide pasture. A wide pasture. Ain't going to be no skinny pasture. He's going to be grazing like crazy. The oxen and the donkeys that work the ground will eat seeds and feed which have been winnowed with shovel and pitchfork. And on every lofty mountain and every high hill, there will be streams running with water. On the day of great slaughter, when the towers fall, I guess whenever God defeats their enemies. Yeah, whenever they're defeating their enemies. The light of the full moon will be like the light of the sun. The light of the sun will be seven times brighter. And the light like seven days on the Lord. On the day the Lord binds up the fracture of his people and kills the wound of the afflict. That's good, man. This is awesome stuff. God's gonna, God, God's gonna care for them. You know. It didn't shed much light on our on our winnowing stuff, but hey, <laughs> why not? Okay. It shall be when Boaz lies down. So he's gonna be out of the threshing and winnowing floor. He's going to be eating and drinking. You're going to be all prettied up as a lady. You're not going to be there in like work clothes, but you're going to be all nice. Nobody's going to know. He's, and, and don't let Boaz notice you. You're going to be able to be unnoticed by Boaz. And he's going to eat and drink and he's going to lay down. Maybe, maybe they made parties out of this. Maybe they were like, hey, let's have, a, let's have a festival. You know, You know what? This is at the end of the wheat and barley harvest. And they did have festivals. At the end of the wheat and barley harvest. Maybe that's what they're doing. They're, they're, they're like, yay, we got everything. Okay. It shall be when he lies down, you shall take notice of the place where he lies. Okay. Go watch where Boaz lies, Ruth. You shall go and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will tell you what you should do. And Ruth said to her, all that you say, I will do, Naomi. Don't worry, Naomi. I'll do it. I'll go get all dressed up. I'll make sure Boaz doesn't see me when I'm there. And then when he lays down and he's he's been all he's he's eating and drinking, he's asleep. I will go lay by him and uncover his feet. I don't know. I don't know. I have heard, okay, from scholars who are very smart who study this stuff. That's a euphemism for having sex, for uncovering his privates. Look in the NET. I looked at this like a, a few minutes ago. I was looking real quick through it. Then go uncover his legs and lie down. But everywhere else, uncover his feet. At the place his feet, uncover a place at his feet. And you lie down. Okay. Uncover a place at his feet. Naomi, y'all can't read this. It's really light. So I'm going to read it for you. Naomi advocates a course of action that will lead Boaz to act. Israelite custom and moral expectations strongly suggest that there is no loss of virtue involved in the scene. Okay. So in other words, the NABRE, at least, the, the, the scholars who... Translated the New American Bible Revised. Listen, New American Bible Revised Edition. The scholars that translated this, they made sure and put a note right here. There's a little note. And the note says, Israelite custom and moral expectation of the Israelites strongly suggests there's no loss of virtue. So in other words, they don't, the thing I said about uncovering his privates, they, they, they think that's not what this is, evidently. The, the, the scholars for the New American Bible Revised Edition think they, those scholars think that this is not about the intercourse, about having sex. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, uncover his feet and lie down, uncover his feet and lie down. 
I don't think uncover feet is anywhere else to my knowledge. Uncover his feet, that's Ruth 34, Ruth 37. Oh, that's it. Oh, two, 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 just two. Let's say uncovered feet. One and uncovered Ruth 37. She came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful. Ah, so it kind of is a party. So they're winnowing and they're drinking. Okay, he gets a little tipsy. He lays down at the end of the heat. She came secretly, uncovered his feet, and laid down. Whatever uncovered feet means, I don't know. What if we say cover? Because there's one other place where feet are covered. Covers all the skin, even from his head to his feet. Right here. Seraphim were standing above God, each having six wings. With two, they covered their face. With two of their wings, they covered their feet. And with two of them, they flew. These the six-winged creatures standing above God, they're flying around or they're, it says standing above him, but with two, each flew. So it could mean two are used for flying. They covered their face and they covered their feet. So, mm. Is Boaz a, a, an angel? And he's keeping his feet covered. Uh, covering your feet, kind of a dignity thing. Feet were, I, th I think. Uh, um, where am I getting that from? Now I'm just kind of starting to talk from memory, but I could, you know, could be wrong here. We're trying just to keep it in the Bible here. I also clothed you with prolifically woolen clothes, put fine sandals of leather on your feet. I wrapped you with fine linen, covered you with silk. Sandals on your feet. Do not cover your mustache. That's a... Uh, Covering your mustache was a thing whenever whenever you had leprosy, you cover your mustache and you yell, unclean. Why do you cover your mustache? I, I don't know. I'm not sure about the whole mustache thing. <laughs> uh, oh, that, that the mustache thing about covering with leprosy. It's a, uh, when you've got leprosy and you cover your mustache and you say unclean so people don't come near you, that's in Leviticus. Um, that's a law. In Leviticus somewhere right here as for the person who has a leprous infection his clothes shall be torn the hair of his head shall be uncovered he shall cover his mustache and call it unclean unclean because you don't want people coming near you 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 your toes your you tear your clothes because you're mourning because you're probably because you're sad and leprosy you let your hair be uncovered you cover your mustache you you they're trying to say hey guys I'm leprous please stay away from me I'm sick please don't come near me you know leprosy highly contagious all right, but that's not what this is about. This, Ruth, not about leprosy. And it shall be when you lie down. And Ruth said, I'll do it. I'll lay down. I will uh, uncover a place at his feet. In other words, I'll be very pretty. And like when he's asleep and he's laying down. Um, so she went down to the threshing floor and did all according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. Probably took her a while. They're probably threshing. She's like, hey, he's at the threshing floor. You better hurry. Taking a shower and, and, and getting a clean clothes and putting perfume. Doesn't have to take hours, but it could, you know, could, could take a good 30 minutes. And then she's got to get to the threshing floor, you know. But I mean, this could be early in the day. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful. Oh, so now she's at the threshing floor, I'm guessing. She's got to get there. She's trying to stay hidden, like. Like, oh, don't look at me. You know, she's probably just mingling amongst her. There's probably a crowd there. You know, she's probably not hiding behind heaps of grain. Like, there's three people there. And one of them is Boaz, so she's got to hide. You know, there's probably a lot of people there. That's my guess. Because he's eating and drinking. I mean, uh, I guess he could be doing it by himself. Mm -hmm. Threshing all alone. He, and, and she's, like, hiding. Mm -hmm. uh, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. Then you crept up, uncovered his legs, feet. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Oh, she crept up, uncovered a place at his feet, and lay down. Quietly uncovered his feet, came secretly, uncovered his feet. Okay, of feet, feet, feet. And it happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward. And behold, a woman was lying at his feet. Right here. There's a, uh, yeah, yeah. Woo! What the heck? He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet in the middle of the night. Something startled the man. 
And it's like, what the heck? Where'd you come from? Maybe there weren't supposed to be women there at all. Maybe she was high. I don't know. Or, or just a fact that, whoa, there's a lady there and she wasn't there earlier. Why is there a lady at my feet? So uh, Boaz said, who are you? It's, um, it's, it keeps saying he. It's not mentioning Boaz. I don't know why it's not using his name. It's saying the man, he, he, the man. Maybe, I think this is supposed to be like a, a secretive thing. Like, like Ruth isn't supposed to let Boaz know she's there, right? So, so maybe instead of saying Boaz, I think there's a man and there's a woman and the woman's doing this to this man. We're supposed to kind of be, maybe, I don't know. Okay, who are you? It's, it's, it's late at night, it's dark. He woke up in the middle of the night. He started like, what the heck? Uh, I can't, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your slave. Okay. Remember, earlier she said, I'm your servant. Oh, over here. He, so he asked, who are you? I am Ruth, your servant. Okay. Uh, servant, servant, servant. Okay. I am Ruth, your servant. They had just talked to each other, not, not earlier that day, but um, remember before, the first time. And he's like, hey, stay with me. And she's like, I'm your servant. And he's like, hey, don't go anywhere else. And she stayed with him every day during the, the harvest when she went to glean she would only go to his field so he probably knows her maybe they got along maybe they started talking maybe it's like a a, a movie like a where, where where they show they show clips with music in the background of the the man and the woman meeting to eat they meet in the park they're walking around talking to each other you know, i don't know that sounds corny um that sounds silly but i mean she knows that when she says hey i'm ruth i'm your slave he's gonna know who she is so evidently they know each other now spread your garment over your slave, for you are a redeemer. Uh, the word for wings can also mean corners of a garment. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Okay. Uh, may your, mar marry your servant. Oh, for you are a guardian, guardian of the family interests. Oh. So the NET. They're kind of trying to tell us what she means by, by this. Hey, you're my redeemer, so you need to marry me. Uh, you have your family's interest. You're a guardian. You're the redeemer. Remember, the redeemer is supposed to redeem. Spread the wing of your cloak. Okay. The wing of your cloak makes it clear this is a request for Mar Ezekiel 16. It makes sense. Okay. Ruth connects it to redeemer responsibility. A word play on wing links what Boaz is asked to do with what he has asked God to do for Ruth in 2.12. I remember, yeah, back in verse 2.12. Uh, let's look at it real quick. Would, would she have remembered this exact conversation? Maybe, but maybe not. The reason why they're probably using it is because the guy writing, whoever's writing the story of Ruth, he's crafting a literary tale. Okay, he's not trying to write perfect chronological, exact, detailed history. Now, Ruth is history, and it is giving us historical detailed stuff. It's telling us a story, but it's also tell it's telling us a story. So, I mean, it's leaving certain details out, adding certain details in. It's emphasizing this. Ruth might have and probably did say this stuff. She might have said similar stuff. She might have been like, oh, you're my redeemer. You're supposed to marry me, you know. But the author back here, may the Lord reward your work and may the Lord, may your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel. He, the God of Israel, took you under his wings, okay? So now Ruth is saying, hey, just like the God of Israel took you under his wings right here, what's it, um, Spread the wing of your cloak over me. Uh, spread your wing over your servant, okay, for your redeemer. So they're connecting all this together. Boaz, he's a good Israelite. He would know the redeemer thing. He would know that. He would say, oh, wait, I am a redeemer. He probably knows he's a redeemer of Naomi and Ruth, but nobody's asked him. So for right now, he's just taking care of her. He's being a good Israelite, and he's taking care of an orf a widow and a stranger, you know, by saying, hey, let her glean among everything. Give her plenty of food. Maybe he said that because he knew her as a redeemer and he's trying to be nicer to her. But here she's like taking the bull by the horns and saying, for you are, for you are my family redeemer. 
There we go. Okay. Wait, wait. Let's see. Hour and 16 minutes. We're going to stop right here. Stop sharing. Okay, guys. I don't know if I've been talking for an hour and 16, but probably a pretty long time. All right. We'll pick up right there next time, right in the middle of the story of Ruth, Boaz, Naomi, the Redeemer, all that good stuff. All right. I hope we're learning a lot. Let's pray real quick. Lord, you're good to us as you redeem us. You're kind to us as you spread your wing over us. Uh, be loving and charitable and kind. Redeem and uh, spread your wing over everyone in the world, like you've done with Jesus, God. He came and died for us, rose for our sins. Heck yeah, buddy. We can follow him. He'll spread his wing over us and redeem us. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. See y'all in the next Very Basic Bible.